Okay. Everybody here, we're good? So what I want to talk about today is, is um, a little bit about product management. Do you guys familiar with the term product management? Is that something that you guys use? Okay. So what's really cool about the way I look at product management is it's really at the nexus point of it's a, kind of like you're a little bit of a marketer, you're a little bit of a designer, you're a little bit of a engineer, uh, business model, all of those things get rolled into one, especially at an early stage company because at an early stage company, it is the product, right? That's the only thing that you have, right, to sell at that point. So um, you're really, as a product manager, you're almost like a little CEO of a company in a way, um, a CEO of the product, right? And if you are one product company, it's so a lot of times the CEO is probably the chief person in charge of product as well. So, um, but what I want to talk about is less about the discipline of product management and more how do you build com how do you build companies in the early stage and how do you use your co your product to to do that. And so, but first I wanted to start off and just be give you guys depress you guys a little bit and just give you guys the stark reality that most startups fail. And that's just that's just a fact, right? Um, there's some data out there, and we can and there's a link if you see the when you see the slides, you you'll have these slides. But the the data, um, and we could debate the recency of data, but they looked at high tech startups, and they looked at them over sort of a five to ten year period, and they evaluated them. So there maybe there's some sampling bias. So maybe it's a little bit wrong, but I think directionally this is still correct. Um, six out of a thousand of those startups that they looked at got funded, right? Of of the um, it was more than a thousand, but of the the ones that got funded, sixty percent just fail outright. Thirty percent sort of flounder, like they get funded, maybe they raise a little bit, maybe they kind of just never really hit that escape velocity, right? Um, of the ten percent that live, right, of those give sort of like decent returns. The other ones sort of get big and then so what that means is you have a 0.01% chance of sort of like a major breakout success like a Facebook or a Twitter or something like that, right? Um, so that's pretty depressing, right? Because the, the odds or the base rates of startup success are sort of against you, right? But we're all smart here and we're smart and we've got great mentors and everything like that. So even if we're a thousand times better, we still only have a 10% chance, right? So the, the key thing is to figure out why, right? So why, why do these things fail? Like what's, what's one of the common failure modes? And I'm, I'm sure there are many failure modes. Maybe the founders get in a fight or something goes wrong or, you know, there's a lot of other things that can happen. But I think what I, what I want to look at today is what's the most common failure mode of, of startups. And the first thing is, well, if you fail, it means you run out of money, right? They always say the CEO's only job is to make sure the company doesn't run out of money. Because that's really all the, that's, that's the number one thing that defines success or failure of a CEO. If you run out of money, you fail, right? Um, but why do you run out of money? Well, because you really don't have enough paying customers. So a lot of people think, well, because we didn't get funded. Well, funded doesn't mean anything. It's just like, like what we said in the sales um, discussion yesterday. It's about sales. You have to sell. You have to build something that people want, right? Funding just gives you the opportunity to do that, right? But if you don't have any paying customers, it's probably because they're not compelled enough to pay, right? There's nothing that sort of gets them out of their seat. And as we talked about yesterday with sales, they haven't com been compelled to pay. And, and it's probably, and in, in the product sense, it's probably because it's not maybe because you didn't pitch it right, but in here it's the product somehow doesn't meet their needs, right? Um, it may need meet the needs of a few number of customers, but maybe not the mass market that can sustain your business over the long period of time, right? So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. And we have this concept called product. Have you guys heard this term, product market fit? Are you familiar with this term? Hands up, yes, no? No, no, just a few of you, kind of, yeah. All right, so I want, this, this is sort of like the term, it was coined probably a few years ago in Sil like by a guy named Mark Andreessen, who the guy who founded Netscape um, back in you know the, the early to mid 90s. Um, he's now a very powerful VC at Andreessen Horowitz, which is sort of the top flight place to be right now. Um, but he came up with this term product market fit. And that really defines sort of like when you've actually dialed it in, right? You know when you're early on and you kind of have something and someone kind of uses it and maybe they like it, maybe they don't. But this is when you really dial it in and you go from being a pre-product market fit company 
and then you really start to scale up your business and you start hiring and you start scaling up and you go from a thousand employees to a hundred to employees to a thousand employees and that kind of thing. Um, in my career, what I've really tried to focus on is getting to this product market fit um, point, right? So companies that start with a blank piece of paper and maybe an idea to get to this product market fit. After this, this becomes an operations problem in my mind, right? Less of a product problem and then I move on to other companies. So. I wanted to introduce this concept and then really think about how do you get to product market fit? So product management can occur at companies before product market fit, after product market fit, mature companies. But what I really want to focus on today is just how are you going to get to product market fit? Okay. So early on in my career, I worked at Microsoft and we did this. This is how we were taught, right? How we build products. And we were taught this way of you start with this really great idea, your concept or business plan. You have a very firm vision and you, know, you fill out all the boxes and you have all this detail. And you start these really developed these specifications. So you might have heard of terms like a market requirements document or a product requirements document. This is like 80s and 90s. This is revolutionary, right? Like this is how you built products. And then you pass that. You wrote these product managers wrote these detailed product um, market requirements documents, product requirements documents, and they de detailed all the specifications of the product. And then you went over and you handed it to the engineers. And then you walked away for like six months or however long it took them to build the product. Right? And then they went off and, you know, engineering then at some point hands it over to QA, quality assurance, right? Quality assurance tests it, maybe they send some bugs back, they fix it. At some point, the quality assurance team says, yep, it's good to go. And then you hand it over to the marketing team. And the marketing team then goes out and sells the product. And this, this is not old, right? I mean, it's a little, maybe for you guys it's old. <laughs> but for me, this is not that old, right? Like, I started my career at Microsoft. And Microsoft, if you remember, had like Windows 95 and 97 and 98 and XP and, you know, et cetera, right? And that's how these products all got built. And like, when we got to this ship date, the ship date, what they would do is they, they would cut a CD and they put the CD and they would send it to the manufacturer and they would call that the gold master. And they put that box and the box would go on store shelves, right? And that's how, that's how stuff got done, right? And we had this massive party as soon as like we shipped the first product, right? And that was it. We were done. And then we'd go, everybody go on vacation and be over. Um, but that doesn't work, right? Something's changed. Like this has completely and totally changed in the last few years, right? Really since the advent of the internet. And what's really changed is, first of all, we are, we're now competing globally, right? So, I mean, we're here in Russia, you know, an Ameri a set of American people, Canadian people, what have you, are here in Russia, you know, there's competition, mass challenge, 50 countries, all of that kind of stuff. Um, there are lower technical barriers to entry, right? So, all of you have created stuff, right? People, there's people somewhere in a garage in Ghana creating things, right? Everybody's creating things now because there's less technical barrier. There was no, um, even, even when I started Visible Measures in 2005, we had to buy servers and put them in an actual facility and turn them on. And nobody does that anymore. You fire up an instance on Amazon Cloud and away you go, right? Um, and so you can, you can do things with less capital, and customer acquisition is so different now. You can use LinkedIn and Facebook and throw ads on Twitter and all these other others channels. I'm not saying it's, it's zero, but it's very different from having to do television advertisements to get somebody to walk into a store and buy your product on a shelf. It's just a very different model. So let's, let's just go through a few examples of, of companies that have gone through this, right? So, you guys heard of any of these companies, by the way? No? Am I too old? <laughs> right. Okay. So, um, there are some great companies with awesome technology. Webvan is probably the, one of the most spectacular failure stories of, of, of the venture-backed sort of generation of internet companies, right? They went off and what they did is um, really, really, really smart guys. Like guys with great pedigrees, great backgrounds. They raised, a, I think they raised hundreds of millions of venture capital and they wanted to do online grocery delivery. And rather than do that, what they did is they, they set up these insane distribution centers all over the country. They were going to launch nationally immediately. And so they went all over the country and set up distribution centers with all this automation and conveyor belts and all this other stuff. And then when they launched, they realized nobody really wanted it. 
or the, the product nobody really wanted, right? Um, there's a couple examples. Obviously, Friendster Juice started by the Skype guys, like really smart guys, right? They started Skype, so they did peer-to-peer -peer video. But what they missed was what Hulu was doing, right? What they also, Meta Cafe started in Israel, probably the first of its generation. Um, they were based on Windows Media Player. YouTube came along, they built their product based on Flash video and just massive more adoption because of the, the user experience issue. Um, so there's some people who can do this, right? But I think Steve Jobs is probably one of the people that I would say is able to do this. There are some people out there that are just smarter, right? <laughs> They're just better, right? But um, even Steve Jobs has had his failures, right? So the Apple Lisa, the Newton, right? I, did, I bet you didn't know that Apple made a digital camera at one point. They made a game console at another point. Those are things you never hear of because they just never saw the light of day. Um, but there are, I think Steve Jobs is probably the one person who can come out there and just build something and people will buy it, right? You know. Um, so there's this, there's this I, I call this the engineer's paradox is what stops you from doing this, right? Um, and the engineer's paradox goes something like this, which is basically, and you'll know, probably see this in your own companies, right? With, with engineers or you yourself kind of feel this on some days, right? Is that you think that, well, if I put a, product that's not ready for the market and it's crappy and people don't like it, then it'll fail and nobody will want me and I'll get a bad reputation. And, or if I put it in the app store and it doesn't have this feature, I'll get a bunch of one-star reviews and it'll never take off and it'll be dead forever. So I have to keep adding more features, more features, more features to get it to a point to get it ready and then I can put it and then I can ship it and then I can release it, right? But the issue is, is that if you wait that time, you'll never realize if you were building the wrong thing to begin with. Right, so you have to you have to kind of break that paradox to say I'm just going to accept that my product might not be ready for prime time, but if there's somebody who really really wants it out there, right, you got to find that intense need customer and give it to them first and let them try it, right. By the way, you guys can ask questions. Like, <laughs> feel free. Um, so it comes back to this concept of product market fit, right, and. I think one of the one of the big questions that that comes up is how do you know when you have product market fit, right? Well, it's kind of like defining if you ask me to say how do you know that you're in love? Like I can't really tell you how you know you're in love, but you just kind of know when you're in love, right? So, I'll give you an example of of what it's like to be in product market fit, right? So, at Nanigans, which is where I worked before, we were we started off um, and we were kind of going along and I came in to run product and we built the first version out there and it was kind of crappy and we, we put it in the hands of a customer and they sort of caught on like wildfire and the product sucked and it was like, it would break and it would fall down and we were up, we ran 24 hour supports and so we had like three guys running, th like running shifts of eight hours just to answer customer support calls. Um, but it just sort of took off and Customers used it, and yeah, it did break, but they didn't care because they needed it so badly. We had just found, we had struck a chord where they needed it so badly, and we were kind of patching it as, like patching the boat as it was moving, but we had, the phone was ringing off the hook, people were using it, people were buying it, and we couldn't keep up with the demand, right? That's an example of like, okay, we probably had product market fit at that stage, right? Um, it's one of those things that it's kind of tough to define, right? But you kind of know it when you have it. If, you, if your demand is outstripping you, right, and customers are loving it and they're banging on your door for it, then you have product market fit and you should be looking at how to operationalize your business at that point, right? But until then, right, you should be looking at how do you discover and validate the customer need? Like, is this some, do I have the product that people really want and that's going to be scalable, right? Um, and the, the idea there is to survive as long as possible until you figure it out. And that may be, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to, you know, live completely lean and, and do nothing. And so lean doesn't mean cheap, right? So it just means fast, right? So you could raise a lot of money to go faster if that's what you need to do. 
But the other way to look at it is burn as little money as possible to figure this stuff out. But it's really learn it as fast as possible, right? After you find product market fit, your activities are going to be vastly different, right? You're going to be building a sales and marketing and delivery machine, right? You're going to be building the company and figuring out how to scale it at an HR department because you're hiring so many people, right? Um, and it's about getting big fast and getting the scale fast, right? You look at a company, this, these companies like, um, that have grown super fast in the last few, of, um, few years, like uh, Groupon grew fast. Zynga grew even faster, and Uber's grown even faster than all of those. And at the time, Groupon was the fastest growing company in history, and Zynga outstripped it. And then now Uber's come along and outstripped them all, right? And, but they, they launched, I remember Uber launched in 2011 in San Francisco, and we were using it. I had to text with my Blackberry back then and stuff like that. And it, but once, once that product hit you, it was magical. It just changed everything, right? And what they did is then, that's when they raised hundreds of millions of dollars at once, and then they just poured across hundreds of cities, right? So they had to get big fast, right? Um, but you can't do that unless you know what you're supposed to do first, right? Um, so the, the, the way to think about this is there's a, cu a couple different dimensions on how you get there, right? And it, and it depends. So the first question is, who is your customer, right? So there are really three, I, I put them into three buckets, the customer types that you're dealing with, depending on what your, what your company is and what your product does, right? So one is like, you are the customer, right? So um, that could be like the Dropbox guys, right? Dropbox started because um, Drew, who was at MIT, was on a bus one day, and he was building this tool so that he could sync what was on his laptop to his phone to, his, to the computer that he had back in the lab, right? And he, he built a product for himself, right? The guy's at 37 Signals, or even to some degree Steve Jobs, right? Built a product for himself, right? Um, and then they hope that other people have those similar needs, right? And they're sort of leading the market. The other one is you're building a, com uh, you're building a product that's for somebody that's sort of the next bench over. So you're close to the customer. So maybe, you know, when we built analytics, we, that was kind of close to the customer, right? So we understood that because we were users. At one point, we realized that these things were terrible. And we went over and said, hey, we can build a better version, right? So you're kind of close to the customer in that sense, right? And the one is like, you're totally not the customer, right? Facial recognition software for banks, that's not you, right? So, so you have to get, it's a little bit harder. And the, the discipline of product management becomes a lot bigger for you, right? So just to hammer home the next, this, the different, so this one's pretty clear, right? It's these two that get a little bit, hair, a little bit different, right? So I wanted to give you an example with something that's totally not technical, and that's wine, right? So... On the right side, we have Shadow Lafitte Rothschild, right? This is a very old French uh, winery, right? And they've been making the same thing for generations. And if you don't like it, that's your problem. They're not, they're not changing it. If they have their sales go down one month, nobody's stressing about it. They just make what they want to make. And it, they, they do a pretty good job of it, right? But that's, that's it. They're not changing the recipe for you or anybody else, right? On the left side, there was a little company out of winery, Casella, out of Australia. And they had a very big winery. And what they realized that there was this gap in the market of wine like that had pictures of castles and vineyards and all this stuff on it wasn't really, a lot of the younger generation didn't really understand what was what and what tasted good and what. And so they came up with this brand called Yellowtail. And it's supposed to be, it all tastes good, just good enough. It's not going to be bad. It's not going to be, it's not going to be fantastic wine, but it's all going to be good. It's going to be very clearly delineated about the different types and the varieties and the different tastes. And there's going to be no pictures of castles on it where you don't really know if the wine's good or bad and have to read some magazine. It's just going to be okay. Right? So here's an example of you are the customer, right? Totally. Like you're not trying to give that up. And this is one where they took a more of a market-based approach and said, what does the market want and how do we pivot and penetrate and try to adjust our product to what the market wants, right? So keeping with that sort of idea, what I've come up with is, is this little product market fit matrix, which is a kind of framework. It's kind of like a cheat sheet, if you will, to sort of help you navigate this, this whole idea of how do you adjust your product 
management type, right? And your and your go-to-market approach in order to, I'm just trying to keep my notes here too. Um, in order to um, understand how to attack this. And so what, it's hard, I, I get it's hard to see here, so I'll read this for you. But so on the one dimension, there's a two by two, right? So on those one is a, how, where is your product hypothesis? Do you have an untested product process or a strong product hypothesis? And that's how good the product is. The other one is the market hypothesis, right? So is it untested or is it validated? So you can think strong, weak, untested, validated, right? Um, and then what we do is we overlay different types of companies in here or different types of stages you may be at as a company is probably better, right? So in this top one where your product hypothesis is strong and your market hypothesis is strong, you just got to build it. That's what your job is. It's just build it, right? Um, so again, in this quadrant, you would find the more of that founder market fit type of company, right? Um, like a 37 Signals, a Dropbox, um, Chateau Lafitte, right? Rothschild, and even Apple kind of fits into that box, right? In the other box, which is where I think a lot of you may have been or <laughs> still are, is this where you have a very, very strong technology or product but the market hypothesis might, be, might not be as tested, right? And that, that we see a lot at MIT, right? Which is the technology in search of a problem, which is I have this really cool thing and I can do 30 different things with it, but I don't kind of know which one I should start with and I don't really know where I'm going to get the most money, but it, these, this technology is very widely applicable, right? The other one is sort of what I call the McKinsey problem, which is like the consulting firm, where you understand a market deeply, but you don't really know what exactly they want. You understand the needs deeply. We're in this right now, we're launching a new product at Sitter City, um, where we understand we have, the customers are using an existing product, and we know they've articulated to us because they've told us, right, that they have this need, but we don't know exactly what's the right implementation that we'll use that will that will work with those customers, right, that they'll actually use. Because what customers tell you and what they actually do are, can be two different things, right? Um, so we're in that boat right now. And the other one is, is more of the, the yellowtail type problem where you have, um, you take more of that lean approach where you're trying to figure out what the, what the product wants, what the market wants. You may start off as one thing and then you end up in something completely different. When I started Visible Measures, we, were, we started off as an analytics company in this quadrant, right? We ended up as an ad network, right? So it was completely different. We, we might have actually started here, to be honest with you, where we had this cool technology. We applied it to the analytics sector. As we learned more about the analytics sector, we realized there was a really big need for advertising and we kind of moved around this matrix, right? So as a company, you may start in one place and end up in another. So the whole idea is to really try to figure out where you're at right now. And if you're ever in doubt, just assume you know less, right? So if you think, if you think you're here, well, good, that's probably good, but just assume, or if you're not sure if you're within this one or this one, I would just say that you're probably here and take that type of approach. Um, until, and, and, and do that until your revenues prove that otherwise, right? So there's a kind of, there's a little bit of a different strategy. There's some very common things among this. I just want to highlight the differences and we'll go into the commonalities in terms of how you operate when you're in each of these boxes, right? So this first quadrant is what Paul Graham from Y Combinator calls an organic startup, right? Um, and that's where you have that founder market fit a lot in those early stage companies, right? So you're the customer, you have a very firm vision of what you're going to do. You have iterative releases, right? You this works a lot. You see this a lot where there's an existing, there's a well-established market and yours is quicker, cheaper, better. You know, it's, it's very, it's competing very clearly on a new dimension, right? So, um, so technology given problems, things like that, right? Where if you cure cancer, you're probably going to be okay, right? You don't have to test that market, right? Um, so you can find yourself there. In the, in the bucket that, that we see a lot at MIT, right, which is this one where you have, you have a technology but you're not really sure what the application of that technology is and how we started at Visible Measures. I'll give you that example. Um, 
again, we had this very general purpose analytics tool, right, that could track any sort of rich media or um, any sort of code base, kind of like if, you know, if you're familiar with web analytics, how you tag a page, but imagine you did that at the code level and then it would sort of instrument your code. No, we didn't even know how to talk about that, right? We still, like when I describe it to you, I think most of you fell asleep, right? Because like it just sounds terrible, right? Um, but it was a cool technology. You got to trust me on that. So, what we ended up doing was doing was actually saying we did a, a sort of secondary market exploration, right? So what we tried to say is what are the key markets that are happening? Where are markets that are primed and are disrupting and are changing right now? Where are those industries? And then how, how can we map to those industries? How can we solve a problem for those? And I think we picked a, a handful of those markets, right? We picked like two or three, right? And then what we did is we worked really closely with companies in those markets and we built prototypes with them. And we said, does this work? Does this work? Does this work? Some of those worked and some of them were like, some of those, uh, those customers were like, nah, it kind of works. Yeah, I'm not so enthusiastic. And then one day we were asked to, to do a demo at a conference as a startup in Boston, whatever, but we were, we were out on the West Coast. And I remember I was sitting in a parking lot outside of fast food restaurants stealing Wi-Fi because it was late at night and we didn't have Wi-Fi and there was, it was a different time back then. We didn't have wireless modems and stuff. And, and you know, we were saying, what are we going to pitch? Like, I don't know what we're going to pitch tomorrow. Like, we have three different businesses here. We have this industry, that industry, the other industry. And we're like, let's do the video pitch. Let's just pitch that. Because the video demo looks cool. So, and this is around time that YouTube was getting bought, right? So, by Google, right? So, video is like very taking off and it was hot. So, we gave this, we gave this pitch and we showed the demo at this conference. And afterwards, we were just like flooded with like people around us trying to get answer questions and see the demo and see how it worked. And then I kind of turned to my friend who is a partner at the company and we're like, maybe, maybe we're onto something with this video thing, right? So the whole idea there is that there's this rigorous market, there's this there's sort of a secondary market exploration where you can say, for us it was video and gaming and uh, rich media and advertising. And we looked at a few different markets and we did experiments there to see what would sort of stick. In the many right answers, which I'm doing now, right, is this whole idea where you kind of have a very deep understanding of the customer, right? You may be cut the customer, you may be close to the customer, but you really have a, a good understanding of the customer needs, but you're not really sure what's that right implementation of the thing that's going to make them satisfy those needs, right? So, um, so a lot of that is about prototyping, right? Prototyping and, and working with that small group of what we call lead users, if you're familiar with that term. And those are people, lead users are these people who you may find somewhere, right? You may find at a business who you're trying to work with and they have some spreadsheet, this complicated spreadsheet that they've made on their own to try to solve this problem, right? And they have pieces of paper that are written on post-it notes all pinned to their desk and things like that because they're trying to solve a problem and they're trying to fix it with like chewing gum and string and duct tape, right? And they're, they're, they're out there because they have this problem. And if you identify those people and you work with them on that solution, that's really the way to do it, right? People who are actively trying to find workarounds and you're going to automate them and hope that there's more people like them, right? But the first thing is, to, can you solve their problem, right? Um, the other, there's a couple different metaphors we use here as well in product management. I don't want to go too deep on this rabbit hole, but um, one of them I call the imaginary assistant. So when you're working with... Um, when you're working with these people, you said, what if, I, what if I could hire a person to just do this job for you? What would that person do? What would you tell them? What would you want back, right? And they'll say, oh, I want to tell them these three things, and then tomorrow I want a report that looks like this. Okay, I can go do that. I can go build that now, right? So that sort of, sort of mental model, which is like, if you had a butler that could take care of this need, what would it be? Like, I, will, I would have somebody call me when my pipes burst. Oh, okay. Now I understand. Like, if we had a sensor and da da da, da like, you start thinking through it like that, right? Um, the other thing we use are persona. So a persona is sort of a sketch of a fake person, right? It's almost like a caricature or a character. Um, so what we do is sort of, and this helps when maybe I'm talking to a customer. So right now at Sitter City, we talk to moms, right? And so we talk to a little bit above average wealthier moms who are in the Lincoln Park neighborhood in Chicago, right? 
And they all kind of, you know, they shop at certain places and they have certain, they watch certain TV shows and they um, go to certain movies and they wear certain types of clothes. And we start documenting that. We start writing it down. We create these characters, right? So we call, you know, let's say I carry this character, Jane, and she's, you know, 38 years old and she works at Goldman Sachs Bank and she does this, does that, does the other. And what that does, it sort of helps when we go back to the lab to really sort of in, like think about it in terms of, is this something that Jane wants, right? And your Jane or Joan or Bill or whoever your persona name could be a, they could be a B2B buyer. They could be the, the VP of strategy at you know, some financial services company or something, right? So it doesn't have to be a consumer type of thing, but it really sort of grounds it. And even our marketing, we're like, what voice would Jane want to hear, right? Uh, what features would she want? Would she be able to get this? Would she be able to get this error message? Like if she saw this, would this make sense to her? So those are the kind of things we do. And then the truly, truly lean startup, which is here, um, which is you don't really care if you're going to be an analytics company or an ad network one day. You don't really care. You just really want to build something. Um, and you're willing to go where the market takes you. Then you, it, the, the risk there is that you can twist in the wind, right? You hear one thing from one customer and you run and build it. And then you do something else and, and go and build it. And so what I suggest here is you make a list of the, of the, from top to bottom, right? Is like, what is the biggest assumption that you have that would make your business fail, right? In terms of your product. Obviously, you know, you get hit by lightning or earthquake or something, not that, but like, um, Think about it. So, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, we're building an on-demand product for babysitting where somebody can press a button and a babysitter will show up for their kid, right? That's, it's not exactly that, but let, let's go with that for the moment, right? Our biggest assumption is who's going to use that if they haven't seen somebody to take care of their kid, right? There's a massive trust issue, right? It's not like somebody cutting your grass or, your, or something that does that bad and, you know, oh, well, it grows back, right? This is your kid. There's a massive trust issue. So, the biggest unchecked assumption, the biggest assumption we need to drill into is the trust issue. How do we overcome that? Should we, should we um, have sitters from a certain pool? Should they be credentialed a certain way? Should everybody meet them first? Should it be a pool that you've used before? Should it be your own sitters list? So there's, a, there's a number of ways you can solve that. And so there's a number of different experiments we can run there. But that's the biggest assumption. And once we check that off the box, then we go to the next assumption. Well, can we scale this? Or do people want this in other neighborhoods? Or what have you, right? So make a list of those assumptions. And then from those assumptions, a series of experiments will fall out of that, right? That you can use to check those assumptions. And so the basic cycle goes, right? You have some idea or some hypothesis. You do some test. And then you come up with some learning. And that learning feeds back to a new hypothesis, right? Maybe it works and it's validated. Maybe it's like, oh, well, we tried this, but now we got to try that, right? Or maybe it's this, right? So it's, it's all about going around this loop as quickly as you can, right? And the faster you go through this loop, the faster you're going to get learnings and the faster you can reach the product market fit. So that's where I said, when you hear about these lean startups, lean doesn't always mean cheap, right? Lean means about speed around this loop and speed of learning, right? Um, you guys okay? Yeah, you haven't asked any questions yet. You sure? All right. Does this make sense at all, or no? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, no, that, yeah, it's, it's a good point. Um, so the question there, just for the camera, was, is that, you know, can you, can, and I'm, tell me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but can you over-optimize to this persona and sort of then try to mirror back things that you just ask them things that you want to hear, right, rather than be the real thing? What, what we use the personas for is maybe a little bit different. So what we do is, is we use that, so we'll go out in the lab and gather all that field work and we'll do interviews and focus groups and quantitative tests and surveys and all that kind of stuff. It's the synthesis of all that data of how do you actually move forward because you can't look at you know, 50 pieces of data every time you want to make a decision. 
So it's creating that archetype that we can use on a, on a daily day basis. But every now and then we'll go back every couple months or whatever the cycle is, we'll go back and refresh that persona based on new data. So it's not like we use that persona to go craft the research questions. That's a product of the research questions. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. No, that happens all the time. So the, you test, right? And that's that. And the data gives the answer, right? So again, remember in this stage, right? So at this stage, we're still like, we have all these needs, but we don't have anything yet that we can give them. So what that does is it just gives us something that we can, we can use to synthesize the research, right? Build something, and then we're, we're always testing, right? So we'll always go back. Then at maybe that point, like we're sort of moving through the matrix and moving back into another quadrant. But at that point, we actually have a product that we can test, and the test is going to give us the answer, right? Um, and so that's where this. There, so I like that because that segues nicely into the next point. Is like some of these things are really common. Some of these techniques are like, well, I talked about them. And I drew distinct boundaries between them. Um, there is a lot of overlap between these things, right? In the sense of, if you're in any, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. The reason why I ask this question is because what I observe is that a lot of startups, as opposed to going to the actual customer, they imagine themselves as sort of a dummy or persona. Sure. That's not so much better. And they keep referring to his or her imaginary reaction. Yeah. Never going out and going out and talking to Yeah, and I, I, that's an important distinction because, um, the personas are a product of the research, not not a substitute for the research, right? Um, and, and it's more that we can't always, like for every single micro decision, we can't go back to the customer and say, what do you want? But we can, that gives us a framework of which we can make a decision based on it, right? Um, you know, if we're saying, hey, you know, what should this error message in this box read? And, like, you know, it doesn't make sense to ask a customer everything, right? So it's, it's more for those micro decisions and helping us through with, without having to make the big research questions. But again, it's, it's that whole process of checking your, checking your assumptions of what's going to, what, before you're a product market fit, one of those assumptions is wrong. Right, I just don't know which one. Right, <laughs> otherwise you would be at product. If it worked, you would be at product market fit, right? But you're not. So, at that point, it's about checking those assumptions off the list, and that's what's really common across all of these. So that you know, it's I, while I highlighted them a little bit differently, there is there is definitely um, certain commonalities in, in early stage companies, right? So um, some of those are. Are, I mean, if you're a disruptive company and you're trying to change the way people do things, inherently you have unchecked assumptions, right? Because you're having to change the way people do business or they'll change the way they do things, right? Um, so by definition, you have uncertainty, right? Um, uh, so that some of these things that we do are things like prototypes that we test, right? The, how many of you guys have heard of the MVP, minimum viable product, right? Have you heard of that? No? You guys haven't heard of that? Okay. Okay. We'll move on. <laughs> um, the other thing to look at is depending on where you are, you may rely more on qualitative data versus quantitative data. Right? So qualitative data is going back to somebody and saying, how do you like this? Versus running a scalable experiment. So a scalable experiment might be, we're debating whether we should have a feature that um, allows me to export to PDF. I don't know, right? One of the quick things I can do is just put a button. And the button doesn't do anything. It says, hey, e feature coming soon. And I just measure how many people click the button, right? That's a low cost experiment. If nobody clicks the button, then guess what? I don't need to build export to PDF. Right? Because it doesn't matter. <laughs> right? Or I would have gone in and built and spent a development cycle or two trying to build export to PDF and then it wouldn't work right. And then we're like, oh, we can't ship this because it, it, you know, these fonts don't come out correctly. And then we would have sent down that rabbit hole trying to fix that. But if nobody wants it, like you've got to think about these low cost, like really cheap experiments, right? Of how to run it. And yeah, some people are going to be upset. But if you think about it, like, and that's that engineer's paradox coming back again, right? But if you think about it, 
if one or two at the, at the scale you're at now, yeah, there's you're gonna you're gonna get a couple people upset. But if you're at a much bigger scale down the line, like those people have no influence on what's gonna happen downstream, right? So we had that problem just recently, right? Um, we released an app in the App Store and for Sitter City, and for lots of different reasons, we couldn't put the the person-to-person -person messaging system in place. We weren't going to get it done in time. We were going to miss our, if we did it, so we had the, the risk of, well, we can put this in, but we'll miss our peak season, right, of when everybody's downloading, and, and that's the summertime. So we made a decision. What it'll do in the app, right, is it'll pop a message to say, hey, you need to do this on sittercity.com. You press the button, it takes you over to the web. It's a crap, the responsive web in your browser, right? That's a crappy experience. I know it's a crappy experience and I don't like it, and as a perfectionist, I hate it, right? But was I gonna delay the product months for that to happen, or was it more important to understand all of the other things that people were using and whether they were gonna engage with it or not, right? Um, and so we made the call, it's like, let's get it out there. And yeah, some people, and there's a bunch of one star, I was looking this morning and like crying at the one star reviews because it's my baby. Um, but yeah, there's some one star reviews because of it, but you know, at least we now have the opportunity to get to that scale and fix the other stuff. And that, those people will wash out, right? Like, you know, when they're, when we have a million users and you know, you have five negative reviews, it's not gonna matter, right? But this whole idea of using quantitative data when you can, which is how many people click the button, versus that qualitative data where you base, where you start informing that with, with customer interviews, things like that, where it may be one person's opinion, but, you know, it's a focus group or something like that where you're using qualitative data. Um, a lot of times as well, you don't really have the scale. Like if you're a consumer product, maybe if you have 100 users, you maybe don't have the scale to really test something with multivariate A-B testing. Or if you're an enterprise company, maybe you don't have the scale to do that, right? Those types of things don't make sense, right? Um, and so doing something with a little bit more qualitative data, customer interviews, things like that, make a lot more sense. So my hope here is that you can use this as a little bit of a tool um, where, as I said, is like you're going to traverse this as you go, right? So you may start off with a really strong technology hypothesis and, and then really dial in the market hypothesis. And then you're, then you're great, right? Once you've dialed that in, go and build it. Go do it. Go get it done, right? Um, so you may move this way. You may have a strong pro market, uh, you may start off building something for you, and as you start realizing you're building the product that you think you like, um, you may uncover something along the way. Or maybe some competitor comes in and changes the landscape on you, right? Or Apple announces a new iWatch, phone, whatever, right? And changes the entire landscape on you, right? So there's some things that are in your control, and as you, as you learn more, you'll go to the upper right, and then there's some things outside of your control that'll bump you down and make you recheck everything, right? Um, so it's not a static thing, or maybe you'll launch a new product, right? To a new set of customers or an existing set of customers, so you can move all around this and and, and be in different points here. So it's important to think about all of those things as you dig deeper over time. So to close it off um, is just basically is that this whole concept of product market fit is the only thing you should be worried about in the early stage startup, like. There are lots of things to, so I don't mean it, but like, there's a lot of things you can worry about, right? There's a lot of things like, oh, what's happening as a business model? Is this scalable? I don't care if it's scalable if nobody wants it, right? <laughs> That's, a lot of VCs ask is like, well, how many users and what's the market size and what does Gartner Group say? It doesn't matter if people don't want it, right? Like, the market may be $2 billion, but if you can't sell $1 of it, you're not going to get it. So think about it that way, right, is that, this is about really tactical, how do you get down and really try to test those hypotheses that you have to validate all that stuff you put in the investor deck, right? And depending on where you are, pick the right strategy and pick the right approach, depending on sort of where you are on that matrix. Um, and, and use those tools of prototyping, listening, iterating, going around that loop, checking assumptions, right? And, and, and doing it as quickly as possible. And then you can scale it. And then once you've dialed it in and you find that sort of love, sort of undefinable moment of product market fit, um, then you can start scaling up your business. But I've seen too many companies die by premature scaling, right? Where they might have one or two customers and then they go off and they hire a huge sales force. And then those guys all 
all don't sell anything. And that's really expensive to hire and ramp salespeople. And then you, and you fire them because you think the salespeople are bad before you realize that the product doesn't actually fit well enough. You have one data point with one customer or two customers, but it, it's not really a product market fit. Those are outlier customers or not really indicative of the broader market, right? So um, premature scaling is probably the fastest way to burn money and, and kill your business, right? So I don't want that to happen to you. So that's it. Um, you guys have questions? There's more in this deck, and I'll put the deck up so that you can, you can have it and use it and um, engage with it. But any questions? We have 10 minutes, so we can hang out. We can, time's yours. You guys, is that for everyone or? Okay. No. I saw the first part, I couldn't hear the second part. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> okay. 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 So they can have the slides and they can look at it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll do that in the breakout then. Yeah. Or here, whatever. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. yeah, good. So thank you. Thank you very much for pretty interesting presentation. And um, Pierce they are also somehow immersed into this product management. And I have like two, two sorts of questions sure. or, or thoughts about this. So first, uh, in which situation, maybe in which industries or I don't know, which mm -hmm. companies, lean approach, I mean lean startup approach sure. uh, does not work at all, like absolutely doesn't work. So I think, uh, you know, I don't want to speak for the entire lean startup movement, but I think there are certain things that you don't need to necessarily go through the same process. Let's, like, let's re reformulate, like uh, risks. When do you see risks of lean startup approach? When, when it would be better not to use it at all, even if you have some interest? Okay, so, so let's compare and contrast okay. the two approaches, right? So there's the lean sort of approach, and then there's what we call the waterfall approach, where you design and you go through a very rigorous pipeline because you're confident in the outcome, right? So if I had a... If I, if I was a pharmaceutical company and I had a compound that I knew cured cancer, right, you're not worried about the market, right? Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no danger that if I make this, the market will adopt it, mm -hmm. right? Whenever you're uncertain of what, if what you're doing will be accepted by the market, I think that's when you take a lean approach. Mm -hmm. If you're confident and you have something like that where it's more of a, if you can build it, if you're capable of building it, you know the market will want it because there's, mm -hmm. there's very obvious demand or there's poor products out there today that don't do it. And if you can do it cheaper, faster, better, um, and you have the existing distribution channels and all those other things, then yeah, fine. You don't need to take a lean approach. Like Apple doesn't take a lean approach, mm -hmm. right? They don't need to. <laughs> 
right? They have a very strong product hypothesis, a very strong market hypothesis, and they're planning many years out, right? Mm -hmm. Microsoft didn't at the time, and I don't know. Maybe maybe they should Thank have. You. <laughs> Thank you. Right. What are the most uh, effective uh, way to check my hypo hypothesis here yeah, in each approach? For example, surveys uh, or other stuff. Yeah, so, so it depends on what your product is. So, um, so if, you have, if you have something that can gain, uh, your hypothesis can be checked in a number of different ways, right? So it can be checked live with the product or it can be checked in, in offline focus groups or surveys or things like that. Um, those, those can work, but at some point they're going to have to use, I mean, it depends on how far you are along. Um, but at some point, you're going to have to check it against, you know, the, some prototype or something like that. I'll give you an example, right? So, um, this is a totally non-technical product at all, right? So, one of the companies I started makes barware, right? So, um, like a device for making drinks, right? So, cocktails, right? Things like that. What we did is, if we were to build what we wanted to build, right? So, we had prototypes, but if we were going to build it, you know, you have to go get injection molding done and make plastic and parts and the minimum order size is thousands of dollars. That would have been really expensive to go build the product we thought would work. And what we did is we said, what if we use 3D printing? And we'll use 3D printers to go mock up the product. It won't be as durable and as strong, but it'll work in a one-time use capacity. And we threw a party and we had a number of people there um, from different associations and we gave them the versions of the device and we had them use it, right? And we videoed it. And they all knew they were on video and things like that. And we broke down that video into discrete pieces. Anytime people talked about the product, we kept that three seconds of video. And we cut the video up. And then we looked at what each of those were. We, we broke those down into what we called need statements. If somebody said, oh, I wish it had a this, that would be a need statement. Or, oh, this kind of feels kind of weird, right? That would be a need statement. We looked at all of those. And we analyzed and we grouped them. There's a whole process we went through. But that's an example of where it didn't make sense to go do a whole bunch of manufacturing and then test it. Is there a cheaper way that we can test with a prototype, right? And then we iterated through various prototypes that way. So I, I don't know exactly how to answer the question, but uh, the example there is if you can prototype something and get some sort of customer feedback, right? It depends on sort of what your assumption is and what you're trying to test for. Uh, in my opinion, uh, there is a problem for startups when they start to, you know, uh, to work on their customer profile, to think what they need, what they are caring about, etc. What kind of problems they should uh, solve. Uh, probably you know that in IT industry there are several groups of customers, so it mm -hmm. depends on which level, which stage mm -hmm. your product is. Mm -hmm. And for instance, at the first, at the very beginning, there are a lot of geeks and enthusiasts, uh, mm -hmm. enthusiastic people Absolutely. who want to play with your product. It doesn't matter uh, how popular is it, mm -hmm. what is a brand sure. name, they just want to play sure. with it, right? And when you speak with them, they probably uh, will be like in love with your product. They said, it's good, yep. just add this feature, maybe yep. uh, move it out, etc., yep. etc." Yep. And the big approach for startups is to move to another audience, uh, let's say pragmatic. So it's a big, mm -hmm market that we uh, may uh, make money with but uh, yeah uh, the problem is they don't uh, you know uh, the mind of enthusiasts, uh, enthusiastic people, uh, yep. doesn't matter for pragmatic. They sure. do not uh, cooperate with each other. So yeah, I think that's are, a big are you familiar with the the model crossing the chasm, right, right, the Jeffrey right. Morris yeah. chasm? Yeah. That's group. exactly that, right? So you get so the model there is, and just for everyone else, is that um, the early adopters are the first people that are going to buy your product. And I, I, I assume that many of you are, are already selling your product. They're probably early adopters. It's that enthusi it's that lead user I talked about, the guy with the spreadsheet, and and maybe like a in your case, maybe he's got a board of wires somewhere that he's trying to like hack together some solution, right? That those are great early adopters, and they're going to give you great feedback. But at some point, you're your customer base is going to change. And that helped you probably a lot early on if you're selling to those people, sort of refine the product and get it to a point. But always think about um, 
so I'm from Canada, right? We play a lot of hockey, <laughs> right, in Canada. And uh, I don't know if you know Wayne Gretzky, right? He used to say, skate to where the puck is going, right? Not where the puck is, right? So um, that's an example of like, if you're trying to reach a, if you're only going to stay in that market and you're going to make a hobbyist board and sell it, you know, and that kind of thing, like um, like a Raspberry Pi or, or and it's like Twine and those kinds of things, that's great. And they can do that. But if you want to reach a mass market and you expect to be on the shelves of some major store and things like that, then, then that's where you're going, right? And so those things are helpful in order to validate a lot of technical assumptions about your product and does it scale and does it do this and does it do that? But you really need to be testing at some point to the next and, and figure out how to cross that chasm. Um, that's a longer discussion and we can talk about that later too. All right, we can break. Thank you.